Welcome to the Sobriety Diaries, friends. My name is Nate. I am a grateful recovering alcoholic and sober coach. My addiction has shaped the person I am today and given me the ability and voice to help others, and I simply wouldn't be here without it. Recovery is possible. The Sobriety Diaries is a video podcast where we share powerful stories of recovery told by those who live them. Head on over to thesobrietydiaries.com where you can apply to be a guest on the show and join our insiders list for exclusive content, early release episodes, and much more. Also, please share this podcast with just one person in your life who may still be struggling. You just never know what they may need to hear today. Also, before we jump into things today, I wanted to take a minute to thank Exact Nature for sponsoring today's show. Founded by a father and son in addiction recovery, Exact Nature's all-natural CBD products are specifically formulated to help you face the challenges of recovery, be it anxiety, cravings, or even improving sleep. I absolutely love the Serenity Oil, and Exact Nature has even helped me kick the nicotine habit, which I am happy to say, now I am over two months nicotine-free. As a listener of the Sobriety Diaries, use the code TSD20 at exactnature.com for 20% off of your order. Again, use the code TSD20 at checkout. Happy Sober Day, friends. Thank you so much for downloading today's episode and spending part of your day with me here on the Sobriety Diaries. We are venturing a little outside of our comfort zone here on the podcast. And today, my guest is a licensed professional counselor with a forte in substance use disorder. And when it comes to addiction, he has worked within the field in various nonprofit and for profit agencies and currently practices in the private sector, but has insight uh, to many things within the industry and some surprising and almost troubling insight that we will discuss today. He also has taken part in a grand jury testimony in regard to insurance information uh, and the information that we will discuss on today's episode. So without further ado, let's open the diary on Cap Nair. I am joined by my new friend, Cap Nair. Cap, good morning. How are you today? Good, good. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm honored to be here. How are you? I'm happy to have you. Thank you. I'm, I'm doing good early on a Sunday morning, right? <laughs> we are taking a step away from the normal story that we would tell here on the um, Sobriety Diaries. So Cap, why don't you tell us sort of how your life has been affected by the addiction and recovery community and sort of the story uh, that we will tell today? Yeah, I mean, um, I think I've always been an advocate for those that have been marginalized my whole life, honestly. Um, I, uh, you know, I have loved ones and family members that have all been afflicted by addiction and substance use disorders. Um, I've lost a lot of friends from this uh, epidemic that we're currently in. And, um, you know, I have very close family that have struggled through it. I've witnessed it. I've seen how it impacts the family dynamic and further my life. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I just, this has been uh, something that I really am diehard, heartfelt, involved with, uh, to advocate for those that are sick and suffering with all ailments, honestly. Um, but this one specific arena of substance use disorders hits hard because, um, you know, witnessing what the Sacklers have done and kind of uh, the monopolization of, mm. of, you know, the epidemic, it, it's, it's just heartbreaking. Um, and so that's where I'm coming from. Uh, that's where I've been. Um, and, you know, I've been working in this population for had eight years now. I've been researching this for the past five or six years now. And I've seen folks that step into the limelight kind of get shunned when they start speaking about this specific topic that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so I wanted to gather as much evidence as possible because I don't want anyone 
to be duped essentially. Um, and you know, for me, this is more than just an industry, if you will. Um, for me, this is a self-advocacy, uh, sorry, a social justice element um, with regards to, you know, not being duped, not taking advantage of, uh, because this, what's happening right now, it's not okay. Let's, let's sort of just jump into things and, and start with that, uh, sort of compassion, uh, I guess that you were born with and, uh, that helped you decide on this path for your life and, and sort of how it started for you. I always wanted to be a doctor. <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, I'm, my parents are from India and there's a lot of pressure. Uh, I was the youngest sibling, so I had to, you know, do everything right, essentially. So yeah. ever since I was younger, I, I was like groomed and I always wanted to be a psychiatrist uh, ever since I was young and um, helping people was something, you know, we were kind of groomed to do. Um, it's part of our culture. It's part of our religion. So ever since I was young, that's what I wanted to do, service. Um, so I went to Temple University. And that started the whole routine. Uh, you know, I was a bio major, healthcare management minor, religion minor, and I was doing it right. You know, um, finished up at school uh, in four years, and then I was, you know, destined to go to the next step, which was med school. Um, I didn't get into any of the U.S. schools, and you know, long story short, I was like, I'm not going to wait because this is going to be a long road. I just want to get get this going. Yeah. Uh, so I found admission uh, to a few schools in the U.K. And ever since I finished, I've been working in substance use disorder treatment. Uh, so first I got a position stationed at a traditional inpatient nonprofit. And I absolutely loved working there. Um, and I stayed there for almost three years. I accrued all my hours to get licensed. Um, and then I submitted all my applications. And then I was poached, essentially. Uh, and I went over and started working for this for-profit where this story kind of begins. And do, did you find any change in your thought process or the feelings that you had developed when you fell out of love and, and you saw that there was this sort of med management side of things to now where you had finished your certification and sort of were ready to start this next chapter? hundred percent. I mean, I think I was enthralled with being able to work with people day in and day out for longer duration, actually process things, working conjunction with the medical staff uh, in like an integrated fashion to be able to also have this discussion of reducing medication, which was like exactly what I wanted to do. Right. Um, and also have like these thought provoking conversations on why it is that we actually use specific substances um, and then come up and devise coping skills, trigger management, relapse prevention techniques, um, and even go further with regards to like trauma that has been happened um, to really get over or process that productively so that we're not even thinking about using anymore. Uh, that to me was the fruit of everything I was looking for. Yeah, I think we understand in, in, the recovery community that the drugs and alcohol are but yet a symptom of something that's much deeper does do the medical professionals as a whole not um, validate that or do they not seek to to help reduce the the meds or um, you know dive into that aspect of it you know I had that same question um, and for me it always felt like a patch-up job like it felt yeah. like we have this massive trauma happen to us whether we acknowledge it or not we go to a doctor, we start speaking about this specific trauma, and they offer more medication to patch that up. And it just feels like it's a, a broken glass, water's leaking, and we're just adding tape to it. Yes. Um, and that's not to knock all medications. Sometimes medication is fantastic. Sometimes it works. But for me, that's what it felt like. Um, and specifically with the clients that I was seeing, especially in the nonprofit sector, I mean, there is no medication that would be able to resolve all of those things that are happening right. in a 15 minute interval of time with that. So then when I went to this for-profit sector, week one, well, day one, I drove up and I parked my car and I had to Google map my location to just verify that I was at the right spot um, because it was in a row of mom and pop shops in like this very prestigious, very pristine area in Pennsylvania. And I couldn't understand how a clinical campus could be part of a row of mom and pop shops. Yeah. 
Um, and so, you know, after Google mapping, I verified that, okay, this is the place. So I walked in and right away, I was greeted by everyone that I was familiar with from the interview process. And um, I was really alarmed <laughs> in the beginning. And that was kind of like foreshadowing for me. Um, you know, I, 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 I did my best to kind of hide that and go with the flow and ask questions as many as I possibly could. And I was constantly reassured by this like marketing campaign almost. And then I started having flashbacks to Big Pharma. All of the clinical services were happening in the sequence of mom and pop shops, basically. It was the basement of two of the buildings, basically. Um, and they had group rooms and individual treatment rooms. They had a medical room. They had a, a room for tech. Um, and, you know, they had a back exit so that folks would be able to have cigarette breaks in the back. And you know, at the conclusion of every day and in the morning of every day, they had these massive white vans and typical, this is typical of like Florida model treatment. Yeah. Um, and so this was one of those basically. So they had these massive vans and each van was dedicated to a specific sober home and they would transport individuals back and forth to these sober homes. So immediately I was saying to all staff, what is going on with the releases of information? How is information being relayed from those that are monitoring them at the housing and those that are here at the clinical campus? And no one had an answer for me. So I was like, all right, well, HIPAA is being breached right here now. Yeah. Um, so we're all kind of out of luck. Um, Did you get the sense that they were hiding something or that they just didn't have an answer for you? I felt like initially, I was naive in the beginning. So I just felt like they didn't have an answer. Yeah. Um, but in hindsight, I feel like they were hiding. Yeah. Um, and so I was first assigned, I had an issue with the, the HIPAA yeah. releases of information, people texting on their private cell phones, information back and forth right. about these individuals. That wasn't what I was trained for at all. So, um, you know, the first assignment I was given after sort of being scolded by the owners <laughs> that were not problem oriented were solution oriented that became a mantra but over the course of like the first seven months initially it was things were falling apart on a daily basis and the entire house was on fire and you didn't know which house to put it, like which area of the house to put out first mm. um and so it just kept going like that and probably within the first six months is when we saw the most compassion from the owners um, where they were, you know, going the extra mile or so it seemed to, you know, accommodate individuals coming in, buying them clothes, buying them cigarettes, getting them food, you know, um, allowing them to, you know, make extra phone calls to their family to let them know that they're safe and sound. So we all bought in to the facility um, and we bought into the ownership and we saw this recurrent theme of individuals being offered scholarships. And to us, for a for-profit sector, that was phenomenal. Um, for us, we've always been groomed to know that for-profit industry is all about the money. Um, but seeing these owners operate by giving individual scholarship, we were just enthralled. Mm -hmm. And then we saw this shift. <laughs> and the shift happened when the state of Pennsylvania, uh, the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programming, and the Joint Commission came in. And this was like the final frontier to really officialize this specific program in the state of Pennsylvania. Mm. They both came in, their interviews were extremely benign. They didn't ask any insightful questions really. And they gave the stamp of approval. They basically just went through the notes, make sure that you know things that they're billing for are actively happening without doing any further evaluation whatsoever. Mm. Mm. And for us as clinicians on if, if someone's coming in on a scholarship, there's no obligation for us to have to call insurance to then petition for time doing this thing called utilization reviews. Um, but once they're active in the system with an insurance, we then have to start calling and petitioning for time with the insurance company. So for all of us, we were bewildered. Yeah. We didn't understand where this insurance was coming from. We didn't know how folks that were destined to go to jail or prison were coming in now not having a job, not having any family loved ones or loved ones, not to be like biased here, but we didn't understand where the money was coming from for this specific type of policy. And after doing research, these specific commercial policies typically cost in the ballpark of like 350, 
to four hundred dollars a month. Mm-hmm. So that's a lot of money. I yeah. mean, fully employed, I don't know if I'd be able to afford that. Right. Um, so we started, you know, just getting really curious about this. All the clinicians at that time, I was a supervisor of this facility. All the clinicians started coming up to me, asking me these questions. I had no answers. So when I went to the owners that be, I started getting the runaround. And this is where I got very, very nervous. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I didn't work this hard. I've been in school for 30 years. I was like, I'm not, yeah. not about this life. I'm not meant for prison. <laughs> I'm meant for a library. Like right. put me in a library. I'm good. <laughs> um, and how long have you been there at this point? So at this point it must've been like nine months. Okay. Yeah. Um, I start asking questions. I get the runaround. I'm starting to have like really high amounts of anxiety. And um, I'm I'm hitting up the Google machine and I'm looking at all of this stuff about the Florida treatment model. And this name comes up, Kenny Chapman in Florida. And for those who don't know, Kenny Chapman was this individual that was an operator of a Florida model of care in Florida, I forget it was Boca Raton or elsewhere, but he had an establishment and he was making a lot of money doing this same exact operation. Uh, he had, he basically committed every felony you could possibly commit. I mean, he was paying people to be there. He was giving people drugs there. He turned some of the sober homes into brothels, like you name it. He was, so they threw the book at him and he's facing 20 some odd years in federal prison. So I'm looking at this article, panicking, being like, oh my God, this could potentially happen to me. Like, what do I do to like navigate this whole thing? So um, I started taking notes and, you know, everyone's giving me the runaround. So I figured if no one's giving me a straight answer, I'm just going to start researching. And so that's what I did. Um, I started noticing patterns with kind of when people were coming in, where they were coming in from, which specific marketing was bringing them in. I started researching what brokering was all about, looking at like two degrees of separation, basically. If someone's coming in from a different state, who's bringing them in, Mm. trying to coordinate this. And it became kind of like beautiful mind with strings all over the place. And I had this like image of, okay, this person's coming in from this specific facility, be mindful of what specific insurance to come up. And it started happening. And I started noticing these patterns. And then I started getting these pervasive rumors. And one of them was about an individual that worked at a neighboring detox in a different state being paid cash to send referrals over to this specific facility. Hmm. That to me is like legalized money laundering and backing, right? Right. Um, So I started panicking again. (laughs) And, um, you know, I couldn't get anything to justify or validate or prove this, but it it was a recurrence. And so when clients would come in, I would ask them, do you know if anyone's paying you to be here or being paid to send you here? Most of the clients wouldn't have any information with regards to that as they shouldn't really. I mean, that's not their job protocol. Um, And so I couldn't really figure that part out, but I did notice that a large majority of the clients that were coming in at some points were coming in from Florida, coming in from California, And a lot of them were coming in from New Jersey. So you see this interstate thing happening. And as I'm researching, I'm trying to figure out like, why is it that these individuals are being sent to us specifically from all these other states? And, you know, through the research, I'm trying to figure it out. And I figured that insurance has this protocol. So most of these individuals from interstate already had existing insurance and I'm looking at their insurance benefit. All of them had private commercial insurance, which is phenomenal. Yeah. And these folks that were coming in were stepping down at a specific level of care. These individuals that were sending them, they were clearly brokers. I just didn't know it at the time. Had studied the specific benefit and they knew which state to send the next level of care to. So there's this human trafficking element that's happening now where they knew that they would be able to receive the highest amount of reimbursement when sending this client to say Pennsylvania for this, for this example. Mm. Um, and in that operation, knowing that they were gifting this client over to this receiving facility to receive a higher reimbursement, they would then receive a higher amount in the kickback. When the whole interstate 
aspect of it was introduced like is this the point where you sort of had like holy shit there's really something here or was it uh, prior to this or or where are we in the in your um realization process i guess yeah so i mean this was an alarming point um the tipping point was when we had clients that weren't supposed to be at our specific facility that were there solely because their insurance was good. Mm. That was my breaking point um, where, you know, we had individuals that were clearly in need of like inpatient stabilization yeah. that were solely at our facility because they knew that they would be able to bill at a higher interval of time to get the maximum reimbursement. And then in that process, like petitioning for the client to go to a higher level of care, I then had to get into an argument with the owners about why this is inappropriate. Hmm. And then they would give me a directive to keep the client there. And then I would have to go and lie to the owner saying, okay, but then behind their backs be like, no, I'm sending this client over here and getting them to like the proper level of care essentially. Yeah. What I did was I first spoke to one of my mentors and then figured out to get in touch with a lawyer to then start creating a paper trail of everything that I needed to do moving forward. Yeah. Because I needed to prove that I'm not part of the operation, right? Um, so I had this laundry list of things that I had to do. I did those things as directed by the lawyer. And then I quit without having a job lined up uh, simply because I couldn't find a job. And, um, you know, at that point, you know, my wife was furious with me. Like my family was very disgruntled because you know, I'm supposed to be successful. You can't just leave a job without a job. Right. And, um, you know, it was, it was heartbreaking, but I left literally with no safety net. And um, I ended up having to work like three and a half jobs basically at that point, just to make ends meet. And uh, I left my house every morning thereafter at 6 a.m. I didn't get home until midnight every single night. And I did that six days a week just to make life work. Yeah. And, um, you know, in the midst of all of this, I'm also working to report this because for me, I had a vendetta against this company at, the, at that point because they did this to me. You know yeah. what I mean? For one, they put me in this position. For two, like I felt such guilt for operating or like helping them operate the sham organization that literally took advantage of people that were sick and suffering to then sell the company to private equity so that all the owners would then capitalize off of that. So they sold it like real estate. In that interval of time after I quit working six days a week from 6 a.m. to midnight, I just monitored everything that was happening at the facility via employees that I knew that were there and just kept a timeline going. And, you know, seven months of thereafter, I get a call from one of the lead investigators in the state of Pennsylvania who worked for the attorney general's offices. And he's like, Hey, I just got your email. Like, can we schedule a time to meet? And I was so eager to just like unburden. Yeah. And, um, I was absolutely amazed that they actually called. So we scheduled an appointment. I met with them and my first interaction with them was for like three hours straight of just me like verbally vomiting everything yeah. that I had. Yeah. And, um, you know, they recorded everything and um, they were just like, okay, we're, we're, we're going to move forward with this. We have to do a thorough investigation. So some time went by and uh, they were just like, if you know anyone else that's willing to come forward and to speak up. And that's where I started rallying the troops and everyone that worked there was completely dissatisfied with working there and they saw what was happening. And, you know, of course I, I relayed my information that I had at that point. And everyone was willing to come forward and speak. Um, and so they issued me a subpoena first. And in that subpoena, they wanted all the documentation that I had on this facility. So willingly, I just gave everything I had. Um, and that's when the ball started really rolling with getting this operation kind of completed. So uh, as time went on, the company was floundering, essentially. Um, so, you know, the state went in for a few spontaneous, you know, checks. They saw that things weren't really happening. They cross-referenced the, some of the documents that I provided, some of the documents that other employees provided. Um, and then they started issuing out more subpoenas and then momentum really started building. 
where the owners and operators started getting fearful. And, um, you know, things progressed in a way where the subpoenas issued all went to the same grand jury. And, you know, I was the first one to speak, the rest followed suit. Uh, and the timeline kept going where the state then comes in, the joint commission comes in and they cease operations basically for the facility. So they're told they can't admit anyone else at this point. Uh, the state then deems that everyone that's there has to be referred out. And, you know, some more time goes by. And finally, you know, um, we see in the newspaper that, you know, some of the owners and operators have finally been charged. I'm looking at this entire timeline of events and I'm chronicling all the overdoses that happened. And like some folks actually passed away while at this shady facility. And to me, it was like not even vindication. It was kind of like, why is this even existing? And, you know, another existential crisis pretty much of like, what was the purpose of, what was the meaning of all this? If, you know, people are still dying going to this shysty treatment center, you know what I mean? To the point where I'm even hearing reports that people were overdosing in their cars right outside the facility. You know, I, I still don't understand why it took so long. Granted, fantastic. They did the work they had to do. The, the attorney general's offices did the work they had to do. It's valid that they had to do their investigation. I'm upset that it took so long. I'm upset that people died over it. A host of people are probably really upset about that. Um, and it's it, to me overall, just generally, it's, it just doesn't seem like a service. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It's just a complete disservice to individuals in need of health and in need of care. Um, all the while seeing that, you know, within the first year of them operating, they accrued $43 million in one year's time. Wow. And two years, it was something in the tune of like 62 or $63 million in year two. And when they sold the company private equity, the owners and operators basically walked away. Like there were silent owners that walked away with $5 million for themselves. And each of the owners walked away with two to $3 million each. At the, at the cost of, of lives lost and um, many other things along the way. I right. guess. And you found out about it just through, through the news like everyone else did? Correct. Yeah. So we, you know, have this notion that um, big pharma is, is um, you know, corrupt or what, whatever the case may be. And that, you know, big insurance companies don't have our best interest in mind. And really, you know, that uh, is true to some degree and it's something that we have to be aware of well that's where the plot thickens a little bit um so i'm a huge nerd if you can tell already and <laughs> for me in this existential crisis sort of i needed to know more um yeah. so i started diving deeper into the repercussion aspect of it so these names that are coming up i started following patterns again so i can't let go for some reason um and I've been watching and following the money trail. And the money trail is leading me to places I wish I knew not of. Mm -hmm. And so to your point, yes. Um, I think we all need to be mindful of, yes, Big Pharma has done some insidious things for sure. But what I'm showing is that other people are emulating the same bad blueprint that big pharma initiated. To me, it feels like a slap on the wrist money exchange to then take whatever's left over to funnel it in, to do the process all over again. Right. And that's where we get into this whack-a-mole situation where yes, great. Justice was served to this one specific facility, but at that same location, probably eight or nine different facilities have opened up now all doing the same pattern. I would imagine then like the um, audit process or like the regulations typically differ from state to state, but I would imagine that like the audit process would differ as well. 100%, yeah. yeah. Um, and a recent news article came out uh, with the Reading Eagle 
a man named Ford Turner came out with this article that was talking about how the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programming in Pennsylvania, for example, when they do their audits, they're supposed to post all the results online for the public to be able to view and figure out exactly where to go. Right. And um, apparently the last year's postings were completely inaccurate hmm. to the point where they had to remove it altogether. Um, so the auditing process, that's what I'm saying. Like the systemic issue that's here is that no one's watching the watchers and it's extremely alarming yeah. because this allows for everyone to run wild, uh, to do whatever they want. Right. I just, I don't understand it. Uh, so that's yeah. where I'm at with my research. Um, I'm currently in school again, going for a PhD and, uh, you know, this is going to be the topic of my dissertation. So I'm hoping that, you know, some sort of change happens. Tell us more about the book or what it's called and where we yeah. can find it and uh, all that good stuff. For sure. Yeah. The book is going to be called Ill Treatment. Um, and it's based off of a podcast that I was doing all throughout this entire thing. Uh, and then I stopped it because <laughs> I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. And um, yeah, the, the book is going to be out in January. Um, I am leaning towards self-publishing unless the publisher comes and approaches me at this point. Uh, I went through many rounds of sending inquiry. Um, and, uh, you know, it's curious because it feels like everyone's apprehensive to take this book on mm. because it is so controversial and it's, right. uh, it's a hard hitter, honestly. It's, it's, and I can prove it all. So that, that makes it even more yes, cumbersome can... because. Cap, thank you so much, my friend. Yeah. Um, let's keep in touch and Please. perhaps as things develop, uh, we can continue the conversation. I would love that. Great. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening today, friends. Make sure you check the show notes for all the information that we discussed in today's episode. Hopefully you heard something that resonates with you. And if we help just one person, our job is done. You can find all things podcast related and subscribe to our show at the sobrietydiaries.com, youtube.com slash Nate Kelly, where we upload today's video podcast and on Instagram at the Sobriety Diaries pod. Check back soon for new episodes with new stories to tell. But until then, try your best not to drink and be good to yourself. Bye, friends.